joining me in a bit. I'm sure he is heated, all things Dolphins. Got to ask him about some corners. We got to get to the mayor of Shutdown City, but Sunday Night Football. What a game. Listen, some of these games have not been great. Some of these primetime games especially. So I was happy to see what went down in division rivalry. Of course, Ravens taking down the Bengals. Kind of low scoring, 19 to 17. And it was all about Justin Tucker. He did this. He did the Night King thing. He's so confident, and he should be, because he is the greatest we have, people. And it must feel so great to have a 0.05-ish percent worry and concern if you're a Baltimore fan, a coach, Harbaugh, whoever, that he's not going to win you the game there. The confidence and relief and the ease that must be felt in this fan base is invaluable, especially knowing how important it is right now. Get this, 37 games this season decided by six or fewer points, 26 games decided by three or less the second most such games through NFL history, through the first five weeks ever. So you need these kickers to perform. We see it week in, week out, especially yesterday. So credit to Tucker, credit to who's automatic and unbelievable. I could have shut the TV off, but then I would have missed him talking to Melissa Stark about fresh sod and whatever when he got his moment. Tariko was cracking up. We love to see it, and we love Tucker on the show. Ravens needed a win. They have been under fire this past week, deservedly so, by the way. Big blown leads. 32nd ranked pass defense, but this week they pull it together on the backs of a Marcus Peters, who's an emotional spark making plays out there. Brilliance from Patrick Queen, JPP, and this is a perfect pick me up for Lamar Jackson, who wasn't perfect, but he did come back and lead the game winning drive. They complement the, the, the identity of the Ravens to me in the Lamar Jackson era is his MVP level play complemented and, and with the defense and they pick each other up when they're not doing so great and they win and they haven't been able to pull together in the past couple weeks and they did that last night against a Bengals team that really needed a win too. And now they're two and three, and I left my helmet at home. This is not good. And I just want to say this. I love the Bengals. I support the Bengals. But it is fair to question that goal line sequence at the end of the third quarter. Coach, I'm not a coach, but as a fan, I, I want to know what you were seeing. I don't get it. I personally, I don't know if shovel pass was the way to go. I don't know if I'd dial up a Philly special. Unlikely, because I was watching Mixon, and Mixon looked pretty good, and I'm surprised you didn't run there at least once. Bigger picture, the losses conflate and I think that they deflate, or at least they have the potential to, because if we can take a look here, that is now three losses on the last play of the game. That can get in players and locker room psyche, in their heads. We've seen it with other teams. I, you know, I think that this team has the intestinal fortitude, certainly the leadership at the quarterback position to not fall into that. But we've seen it with the Chargers and the Vikings. We've seen it. So my advice and my what I would love to say to this team that I love so much, don't let that get into your head. That's not fun. So, I, you know, I hope Bengals players see it as I am choosing to see it on this week five post Monday, that they're, they are three plays away from being undefeated with a chance, by the way, to change their luck and maybe some of their play calling for week six. All right, some takeaways on uh, other games from Sunday before we bring in Darius Butler. Gotta give love to a place I used to live that I still wish I lived, New York. The Giants, they take down the Packers 27 to 22, early game in London. Part of why I hate LA, these early games, these international, they awful. Oh, I'm up at 5 a.m., 6 a.m. to take these in. Absolutely, I can't, I can't do it. So the Giants now, exciting, four and one. Despite a beat-up roster, this is why it's so important. They come back from 17-3, a deficit against Aaron Rodgers, who gets cheers from everybody over there in London as he entered the stadium yesterday. They did it with no Kenny Galladay. They did it with no Sterling Shepard, a leader, the veteran in that locker room. No Kadarius Toney. No second-round pick Wandel Robinson. The whole receiving core marked absent on the attendance sheet, and Brian Dable somehow finds a way to make that work. That's insane. Jones is completing under 80% of passes just under yesterday. Saquon, brilliant, amazing, huge part of it too. He leaves with a shoulder injury and they somehow are able to keep moving the ball. So it wasn't, of course, just the offense. Wink Martindale, we see you, we love you. We know we'll talk to Eric Weddle about him later this week, but he's transformed what was a, 
a bottom defense to a top 10 unit. And they were all over Aaron Rodgers yesterday. They racked up six quarterback hits. They batted down seven passes. And it's to me, it's Dable. It's all you. It shows coaching. Uh, it shows the importance of it, the change that can be made drastically in an offseason when, uh, you know, the culture changes and the competency of a coach. You saw it with you know, the Rams, and they went on and won a Super Bowl and got to the Super Bowl with Sean McVay when that happened. Dable has that effect, and they're going to be a player with their schedule coming up in this NFC East. They just are. I know. I know, Marissa. Marissa's wearing your Eagles shirt. We'll, we'll calm down. You're undefeated. You were in Arizona. We'll, we'll get to you. I'm feeling like the wrath of Venom. I said something nice about the Cowboys, too. And I heard, I felt it from you. Uh, listen, even if they didn't have the injuries, it would be a stunning four and one start. When you factor in all of that, it is miraculous what they've been able to accomplish. Um, okay, let's go to another game, guys. Let's go to another game. Which one is next, Conrad? Which one do I want to talk about? Oh, the Vikings. They take down Chicago. Chicago had some fight in it, 29-22. But we just have to give them love because they are in first place in the NFC North. I, in my prediction, said they're going to make the playoffs, and I think they might win the division. It wasn't pretty, and they nearly blew a lead, right? They were up 21-3. to But they're in sole possession of first place, and that matters. And it's all because of Kirk Cousins, and I love it because he's now led his third consecutive game-winning drive. Hallelujah, Vikings fans. I believe they are the most downtrodden trodden fan base in the NFL if I was to power rank it because they have been through it they have these stunning losses it never works out for them and the story around last year's Viking squad is they couldn't win a close game they had these one possession losses these one score losses and the narrative around Cousins is always that he can't come through in these clutch moments and now the narrative he's rocking chains after these wins it is amazing and of course it's early but we're seeing a rewrite again Coaching change, it matters more than anything. And they're off to their best start now since 2016. Cowboys, really quick, got to get to this. I'm talking a lot, I know. And Darius is like, let me get on the show. I have takes on these shutdown city mayors. Uh, but this was a great game. Uh, 22 to 10 was the score. It was here in LA. Cooper Rush has another victory in place of Dak Prescott. So this now has some legs, this story. And if you've watched the show, you know that I've done everything in my power to avoid this being a storyline. Uh, I wouldn't even talk about it, about Cooper Rush versus Dak Prescott. But then he went ahead and took down the defending champs, and now he's 4-0 as a Cowboy starter, and we are forced to think about it because he has not thrown an interception yet. And, you know, the stats might not wow you. The 4-0 certainly does, but the team's playing at a high level, and we're hearing rumblings of Dak Prescott being held out another week. Huge, massive showdown to Rico Collinsworth, him throwing the pen, the whole thing. That will happen on Sunday night in the NFC East between the Eagles and the Cowboys. And it, I'm getting ahead of this because it's gotten to the point that if Rush wins that game and is then 5-0 and and they take down, cover your ears, earmuffs, Marissa, they, <laughs> they take down an undefeated <laughs> Philly team, I'm sorry, but they can't take Rush out. I agree. They can't. They can't He's on a heater it. right now. They can't. It's not even a heat. I mean, I'm just saying this. It's a very interesting, compelling uh, Jerry Jones situation because we just might hear if, if this happens next week, week six, that, you know, may, there might be a setback with that thumb with Dak Prescott. Jerry could surprise reporters on that radio show and say that may, Dak's not yet gripping the ball well enough. Maybe he stubs his toe as an injury to the list and that timeline for Dak to return gets moved back. It's a very interesting decision to think about Eagles, Lions and Bears for them.